All right. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Biz Books. My name is Gene Marks. I'm glad you're joining us this time. Hopefully, you've been enjoying this series. I've talked to a lot of great authors that have written a lot of great business books that I have learned uh, so much from. And uh, today, um, we got another great one. Marty Kagan has written a book called Empowered, Ordinary People, Extraordinary Products. Marty, first of all, I I, I should have asked you this before we started recording. I, I did pronounce your last name right. It's Kagan, right? Perfect. Good. Just wanted to make sure that we got that. So Marty, thank you very much for joining. I have a million questions to ask you. Um, I loved reading your book. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm into all the things that go into making great products and great an experience. So um, it's just just my kind of book. Um, Before we jump into the book, um, tell me who and what is the Silicon Valley product group? Sure. Well, Gene, thanks for inviting me. And um, Silicon Valley Product Group is really just small. We're just six people. Um, What had happened was uh, all of us had basically been working in the tech industry for quite a while. Uh, And after, um, you know, after, well, for me, 20 years of leading product organizations in uh, in these tech companies, I wanted to really just work with startups and I wanted to uh, ad- advise companies, coach more companies and kind of get involved in all the excitement you kind of see around you. And so um, I started SVPG with a few of my friends. We've all, we're all senior, we've all um, led large the block. organizations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so um uh, there were there were uh, two of us that kind of gets got started, and then as I, I've known people around the industry, around the world, that have been, um, I knew they had the right experience, um, and when they had their companies had gone public, when they had kind of reached those big life events. Then I reached out to them and said, "I think now is the time." And um, hmm. so there's just six of us, and. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun because we get um, most of the companies we work with are companies where I I knew the founders or we've known them through the sort of history, the, whether they came from Netscape. I worked at Netscape, the original internet company. So a lot of companies spawned out of that or eBay, which was another one of those feeder companies. And so that's um, that's kind of made it fun. So, uh, so my company, I have ten employees, and we, uh, you know, besides all the writing that I do, um, we, we, we're I've been around for like twenty five years, and we implement CRM systems, right? So we do Salesforce, we do Microsoft Dynamics, we do Zoho, and a few others. But we're like an established, non growing company. I mean, you know, it's a nice company, but it's you know, it's what I, I get the feeling that I'm not your target customer or client, correct? You've, you've got a different type of client that you work with. Is that right? Well, it's interesting. So in t- the core of my business is actually investing and advising in these companies, which you're right there. I'm looking for, as most investors, looking for big growth, yes. uh, high potential. However, uh, product, which is what we advise on, product powers every company. Right. And so one of the things that we like about it is, and that's also probably similar to you, one of the reasons I started writing books was to be able to try to help people that would never really come on my radar. Even if they were in some corner of the world I've never been to, they've you know not going to be able to afford my services, anything like that. Mm. Uh, if, they, if they care about providing a great product or service, then that's what I care about. And so the book was meant to reach way more than we could possibly reach, you know, on a personal one-on-one kind of basis. Yeah, that makes that makes complete sense. You know, so and in my company, like we resell products, but our actual product is a service. You know, we implement yes. people hire us, so um, that would be the kind of stuff that you know you know, would be helpful to get it. That's why I found um, um, your book as good as is. Okay, so. Let's dig into it a little bit, Marty. I mean, there's, you know, as you explain in many parts of your books, there is a lot of things that go into the product itself. I mean, you know, it's people, it's coaching, it's staffing, it's having a vision, it's topology, it's strategy, it's objectives, a bunch of different things. Um, You talked about coaching. So let's start with that. Okay. Um, You asked the question, I'm going to ask you the question, you know, back to you about 
having a coaching mindset. And this is all about creating and developing great products, right? So what is a coaching mindset? Why is that so important for developing products? Good. Well, maybe it's important to preface this because I think, you know, my world has been focused very much on technology powered products. Okay. And so I always give people that disclaimer because I just hit 40 years. So I've been doing it a long time, but, but all you know, I, in truth in the 40 years, I've never actually worked on a non-technology powered product other than if you want to say a book, okay. which is, which is not. And so I've been told that most of these techniques apply to non-tech products, but without having that first-hand experience, I'm always a little nervous about saying that. But in tech-powered products, there's a lot of very specialized skills that go into it. There's obviously specialized engineering skills. There's specialized design skills. There's specialized product management skills, data skills, research skills. And the thing is with those kinds of skills, it's almost never taught in university. All, almost always these are things you have to learn from someone else. And so what I mean by coaching mindset, and don't, you know, you're looking at somebody who benefited from this, otherwise I would never have got a start here was um, when you are learning these skills yourself and you build those skills, let's say when I started, I started in engineering and I learned engineering skills. And luckily I had somebody, people, I, of course, I, I studied computer science in university, but still you don't really learn this stuff until somebody spends the time to help you through it. But once you get promoted and now you are a leader what coaching mindset means is that I have to stop thinking of the product as my product. And instead I have to start thinking that the people are my product. Right. right. And that's really the difference. And I, I, I do spend a lot of my time coaching new leaders, new managers to realize the difference and how they have to focus on building those people. Got it. So you give some examples in that section about, you know, certain people that inspired you because they did have that coaching mindset. One of them was a, a guy named Rob Chestnut. The, he was the chief ethics officer at Airbnb. Um, what did, what did he teach? Well, uh, Rob is a, a great example. The super interesting guy too. He, um, so I first met him at the, at early eBay. Mm -hmm. He was their first sort of legal person. Uh, he had come from, um, uh, I'm trying to remember, I think it was the FBI, but it was one law enforcement agency. Okay. He was a lawyer and he was sort of the only lawyer there. And I was the head of product and there were a lot of things that he had to explain, tax rules, uh, laws about um, fraud and money laundering, all these kinds of things I had to learn, which mm -hmm. how would I have learned those things before, right. <laughs> really? And so he, as uh, you know, he as one of those leaders, he's one of those people who spent time to help me learn what I needed to know in order to do my job. Got it. You also mentioned um, a guy named Bill Campbell in that in that paragraph. Tell us a little bit about him. Yeah, Bill's. In fact, I ended up dedicating the book to him. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny because I didn't. I've always admired the person, but I, as I wrote the book, I realized how much of the book mm -hmm. was really credited to him, should be credited to him. So uh, I had met him several times, but I had never been coached by him. But he was literally known as the coach of Silicon Valley. Unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago. But he literally was the, the guy that coached um, Steve Jobs at Apple for many, many years. And of course, he was on their board for many years. He coached Larry and Sergi at Google and then many of the next level, level leaders. He coached Jeff Bezos at Amazon. Hmm. And I, I was lucky because three of the people that coached me were coached directly by him in hmm. my career. So I, I didn't even, so many of the things he, he said were passed down, sort of trickled through the ecosystem in these companies. And it's pretty, if you've ever been like Amazon, Apple, Google are three very different companies, but they're all great at product. Mm -hmm. 
Right. And I think you can trace a direct line to this guy, Bill Campbell. Mm -hmm. And in fact, after I started, uh, I, I finished at eBay and I wanted to start SVPG and I wanted to start writing. I started blogging. And anyway, one of the first things I wrote was I wanted to write lessons from Bill Campbell, things mm -hmm. I learned from him. And I wrote it up and I sent it to him. I, and it was so adoring, you know, it was totally, you know, fanboy stuff. Right. And I, um, <laughs> I shared it with him and he said, oh, I appreciate it, but please don't publish this because I don't want the attention on me. I want the attention on all the people I coach. And he, he you know, he, when he died, except for people in Silicon Valley, most people didn't even know who he was. Most mm -hmm. press didn't even know what he was, who he was, which is remarkable given the impact he had. In fact, after he passed away, uh, a few of the leaders at Google that were so grateful to him wrote a book called Trillion Dollar Coach, which was showing this one guy created more than a trillion dollars of value. And uh, of course, today, if you add that up, it's more like 10 trillion in value. But still, um, the guy had an amazing impact. And he was a genuine, I mean, he was the CEO of Intuit. He was a genuine leader. You know, you know, I tell you, my from listening to you, my takeaway though, it, it, particularly when you're talking about coaching, is that you know, you know, we always talk about you know where you talk about having a great product, you know, is is based on the people, and so to be a leader, you need to coach your people uh, because in the end, it does come down to them. But um, the leaders themselves need coaching, right? So if you're a CEO or a business owner, uh, you know, the coaching doesn't stop with you. You you need, and and I guess you need to find your Bill Campbell wherever that person is. Where do you find a guy like that? I mean, how do you even, you know, I mean, he, clearly he sounds like a one of a kind, but yeah, I'm just kind of curious, like, where do you find a good coach to help you? He was a one of a kind. However, he did make a big impact. I have, I know so many people that spread his teachings. Um, I know people who play that role in New York and San Francisco. And uh, of course, my world is more the tech hubs, but I bet there are people like that in, in all walks of business um, mm. that, you know, they, everybody's different, of course, mm -hmm. uh, but they are, there are people out there and there's also groups. Um, there's a group called the collaborative game council. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's an, it's a group of about 400 uh, leaders of mm -hmm. companies and it's run and it's run by a guy named Phil Terry. You probably, in, yep. in fact, if you'd ever like an intro, I'd be happy to do it because he believes that every leader needs a peer network right? Uh, so that you can kind of get those, you could work through hard problems with some others that really can relate to what those problems are. So he feels the same way. Everybody should have a Bill Campbell. Yeah. <laughs> but if you can't have a Bill Campbell, you should have a set of people that uh, you can rely on. Okay. All right. I had more questions on employees, but I want to, I want to, you know, have respect for your time. So let, let's talk about products. Okay. Um, you talk about product vision and then product principles, Marty, What what exactly is the difference between the two? Sure. Well, a vision is literally trying to describe the future you are trying to create. Okay. So it's, it's, you know, somebody, it's usually a founder or a head of a company trying to say, this is why, this is how I want to make the world better. Right. And so they'll describe how, and, and to be honest, it's usually three to 10 or 20 even years out. So it's way out there. How are we going to allow, like imagine the founders of Airbnb describing this future where you don't have to stay at some local hotel. You can go and tap into all these spare rooms and it's just going to be an amazing future, even though nothing existed before like that. Right. That's it's almost vision. like that's interrupt you. It's almost like you're saying, you know, five to 10 years from now, when all the smoke clears, this is what we expect our product to have accomplished or what it what, what it will be doing. Is that, is that's that a good exactly point? right? And, and I like the metaphor <laughs> because yeah. there's a lot of smoke yeah. <laughs> up yeah. until then. So that's right. Okay. Now, product principles. principles slice it a little differently. Product principles are trying to get at what you believe. Uh, is important. So this is more a reflection of your values. Hmm. So um, for example, early eBay, the, the vision came from Pierre Omajar. He was the co-founder and I loved his vision. It was this vision. And you have to realize the internet enabled this vision. There was never anything like eBay before the internet because his vision was 
Anybody in the world should be able to buy anything from anyone, anytime, any place. And I thought that was such an interesting vision, like the world's most giant bazaar. Mm. And and that's a vision, and you can imagine, and you can see it today. Etsy is a, is probably a better version of his original vision, but still. Then he also had a set of principles. So, for example, the revenue on eBay, you, they make their money by the people who sell things. Right. You pay a little fee to list it, and you pay a little fee after you sold it. Uh, but he realized that uh, sometimes the needs of the people buying on eBay are going to be in conflict with the needs of the people selling on eBay. And so he said, what are we going to do in that case? And he realized we need a product principle here that explains that even though the revenue comes from sellers, we have to optimize the experience for the buyers because the buyers are the biggest reason sellers even come. Got it. Got it. Now you talk That's about you talk about it, you know when you're comparing principles with with vision. You talk about something called the North Star. Can you right. explain what you mean by that? Yeah, um, product vision is, in one sense, it's obvious why it's important. You're describing how you're going to make your customers' lives better. Mm. But here's uh, it plays many different roles in the product vision, and one of them is when you're a small startup business. It's everybody in the company knows what the vision is. It's not that hard okay. because you know, you know everybody knows everything is this <laughs> a little startup. I love that. But you know what? As you grow, as you get into growth stages and you start growing, and let's say you've got 10, 20 teams all working on different parts of this vision. Yeah. You need every single team to know how their work contributes to the larger whole. And how their work is still meaningful. And that's why we refer to the product vision. The bigger you get, the more important that vision is because the vision serves as that North Star. So that every team, even if they're located in different parts of the world, which increasingly they are, they all know how it all fits together. And they know that they're not just a little cog in a giant wheel. They know that this is meaningful. And that's why uh, it serves as this North Star. And a lot of companies refer to their vision as their North Star. Love it. I love it. All right, Marty. So, right. So, you know, listen, we're, we're, you know, you've got product vision, you've got product principles that we're doing where, you know, we're, we're, we're putting up an environment in our company where we have the kind of coaching that both employees need from its leaders and the leaders themselves needs. Um, you mentioned as a company grows in size and, you know, you have more people, you have more teams, um, you know, the topology of teams becomes more important. And, and you write about something called platform teams versus experience teams. Um, can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah. Now, admittedly, this is the most technical of the concepts in the book. So um, bring it on. <laughs> this is one of the more hardcore concepts. Uh, and this is kind of a non-issue when you're a small startup. A lot of things are non-issues when you're startups. Although, of course, paying the bills is yes. often an issue that's when you're a startup. Issue. So that's yeah. certainly an issue. But uh, as you grow, this question of how do you slice the pie, how do you divvy up the work mm -hmm. becomes increasingly difficult and also increasingly important. And as companies get larger, they start to realize that, um, and this, this is a pattern, so it's not always true, but it's pretty common. Right. But we can, I mentioned Airbnb before. Right. These are, at Airbnb, if you've used it, you know there's uh, hosts, people that have a room to rent, and they have guests, people like us that rent a room. So, there are teams that focuses on focus on experiences for hosts right. and teams that focus on experiences for guests. And that makes that's kind of logical. Those are called experience teams because you focus on those different experiences. Right. But there's a large number of teams that are there to enable all the experience teams. And those are called platform teams, basically the teams that all this stuff builds on. And when you're smaller, it might be like a small set of people, small number of teams. But as you get larger, it's often half the teams right. because right. these platforms are very, very high leverage. And a lot of the heavy lifting in a product happens in these platform teams, handling 
billing, handling reporting, handling uh, authentication to make sure you are who you say you are. Yeah. So those would be examples of platform teams. That, and in big... The, I just want to say that the reason why that makes sense to me is, I mean, listen, I, I, I flick a light switch on. So my experience there is having the lights go on immediately uh, to brighten up a room. That's that's my experience. And I'm assuming there's, there, there's a team to make sure that that process is as easy as possible. Um, but mm-hmm. behind the scenes, right? I mean, all that has to go in to making sure that the power is, you're telling me before we started that your power went out. You think about like, <laughs> like all the stuff that went into getting the power to your house, like so it just flick that. That's, a, that's the platform, I guess. All the things are going exactly. on. Right. Exactly. Right. And you've got two, you know, so you've got two different sets of teams. I mean, the biggest issue that you have with those, I got to imagine is, um, you know, it, it's a different right brain, left brain kind of thing. I mean, it seems like the platform team people are the, they're the geeks and the engineers like you, you know, and the, the, you know, the, the developers, the experience team might be more of the, you know, the user interface people, right? You know what I mean? The, you know, the people are more have that side of their brain and I guess getting them to work together and, and all towards a vision of that kind of product, that's can't be an easy thing to do. Yeah. And you know, that's what the way you characterize it is largely fair. They are more technical in the yep. platform and they're, you know, cause in a way their customers are really the engineers on the other teams. So right. that's right. Um, and yes, getting all these teams to work together. And at the end of the day, like you said, when the smoke clears, have it to be a beautiful experience for the customer that takes, that's hard. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, um, a lot of people are probably doing this this holiday season, but I bought a new pair of the latest um, Apple AirBuds. Yep. You know, and you know, all you literally do, you unpackage it, and all of a sudden, it, all the other devices you have recognize yep. it, and all of a sudden, it's like this beautifully seamless experience. Yep, that yep. does not happen easily. I can <laughs> tell you that firsthand. It does <laughs> not happen e- easily. Apple has a huge machine to make that experience amazing. Mm. And and a lot of people don't understand that. In fact, I wrote this whole book about empowering teams, but Mm. leadership plays a critical role Mm. in making that happen. Mm. And otherwise, that would never occur that way. They'd be like most companies where we'd have to be reading manuals and Mm -hmm. we'd have to be turning stuff on and calling support and all that. But no, if the leaders are involved enough and you have that North Star about how this is supposed to work together, you know, you really can do some amazing things. You know, you, you mentioned a couple of times in the book, we're, we're talking about teams here about, you know, about you know, remote workers. You know, I mean, we're obviously we're in a work from home environment and, you know, with, with, with COVID and, you know, that, that's not going to change. That's going to be part of you know, our workplace forever uh, to, to a certain degree. And in that same chapter of your, your team topology, um, you do talk about the importance of proximity of a team. So can you can you explain what you mean by that by proximity and why you think it is so important for teams? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and it's another really nuanced topic because of some, I mean, well, the f- main reason is because we're talking people here and people are pretty complex. Uh, the the thing that's important to realize in terms of technology powered products, whether it's iPad, uh, I Airbuds or a Peloton or really you know, Zelle as a payment service, any of these. Um, yeah. So the reason that you have to understand is there's really two parts to creating products like that. Okay. The first thing you have to do is discover a solution that works. Okay. What we mean by that is it's valuable. People will buy it. It's usable. It's feasible. We can build it and it's viable. It can also work for our business, which means we can market it, we can sell it, we can support it, means that it's legal, it respects privacy, uh, compliance, and also we can monetize it and we can pay for it. That's a lot, that's viable. So that's what we mean by discovery. And then once we've figured out that solution, that product we need to build, we also need to build it. Mm -hmm. That means engineer it, it means test it, and it means deploy it into our customers. So those are the two kinds of things every product team has to worry about. 
It turns out that proximity is a lot less of an issue for delivery things than it is for discovery things. Okay. So the first thing to keep in mind is most of the discussions we have about proximity pay more attention to the discovery things. So, and proximity really just means how close are you? It might be how close are you to your colleagues on your team? It might be how close are you to your boss? Mm. It might be, and very often is, how close are you to your customers? How close are you to um, other parts of the organization that you depend on? Mm. So this is a factor we consider a lot. The main reason it's important in discovery is when you're talking about with your colleagues, because so much of discovering a technology-powered product is true collaboration. Right. And I I don't mean that as a buzzword. I literally mean uh, a designer an engineer, a product manager together in this give and take to try to figure out how can we design this so that it hits all the boxes, like valuable, usable, feasible, viable. That is a back and forth discussion that you can do over Zoom. I am doing it with companies over Zoom, but it's a lot harder over Zoom. So it's slower over Zoom. It's also more fatiguing over Zoom. So what I think is happening already and will probably be long-term is uh, the hybrid work model kind of gives you the best of both. So we will probably see uh, lots and lots of organizations have this hybrid model where a couple days a week, at least a few key people get together to solve these truly collaborative problems. But most of the time, people can be working from anywhere, which I should say is a big advantage for us because now we can tap into the talent around the world. Right. 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 You know, Marty, you, you did you you did not address this in your book, mainly because it was not a thing to address at the time, but I'm going to bet you will be in the future. So to, I'm curious to get your thoughts on, um, you know, on Meta, uh, you know, Facebook's you know, brand, rebranded name and, of course, the whole metaverse, which, you know, billions and billions are being, you know, being invested in. You know, we're talking about teams. We're talking about, uh, you know, building teams, coaching each other, uh, you know, you're bringing, you know, your, your platform teams, your experience teams together. And right now you just said, you know, which is true, we're doing it over Zoom. Maybe we'll do it in hybrid. Have you given thoughts about, you know, what, you know, what the next generation of technology will do to help with teams? Do you think that, um, you know, Zuckerberg's and, and, and some of the other leaders who are behind the meta, you know, you, 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 the whole metaverse, do you think that that will have big impact on teams and relationships? And you know, what are your thoughts on that? Well, they're complicated, mostly because I need to untangle uh, Facebook from right. the concept of a metaverse. Right. Um, no secret, Facebook is an evil company, and I do not expect uh, good things to come to the world from them. Okay. So full, put that aside, though, mm-hmm. and talk about the concepts mm-hmm. in metaverse. Are there, is there real potential with those? In many cases, I think yes. Uh, and, you know, these kinds of scenarios, use cases, how we use technology to complement the, the sort of the physical world experience in the mm-hmm. virtual world. There's all kinds of great work that I think will come out, especially if you look in the gaming world and how much progress they've been making. Uh, so, so I do think there's real potential there. Uh, I haven't seen anything that talks to the kind of collaboration I'm talking about in terms of how teams can work really right now, but um, but I still think there's lots of other scenarios where that will be beneficial. Okay. Um, staying on teams, because you have a couple of chapters on this. You, know, you talked about platform teams and you talked about experience teams. Platform teams being, well, experience teams being what the users ultimately are getting the customers and how they're experiencing your product and the platform teams is all the stuff that's going on behind the scenes to make it happen. You use the example of getting earbuds. My example, by the way, was uh, we got like a new Alexa uh, in our home. Same thing. Like we plugged it in, thing was up and running, recognized our network, recognized my account, the whole creepy, but um, easy. 
And so the experience was fantastic and the amount of work that had to go on behind the scenes to make that happen. That's the platform team at Amazon that, 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 you know, that, that made that happen. You also talk about feature teams and product teams. So yes. what are those? Well, that's really at the heart, in fact, of the, of the new book, because now we're really talking about the two fundamental styles of leadership out there. Okay. Uh, and the two styles, they're, they're traditionally called command and control. Okay. Uh, is con- Command and control has been around since the Industrial Revolution, basically. So this is the boss that basically says, this is what I want. And they just pass instructions down to the teams. Now, in the tech world, that usually comes all the way down to the teams in the form of a bunch of features that are in re- requested. They're usually put into this thing called a roadmap that just says, this is what I want. This is when I want it. That's the command and control model. That's been around forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's still used in the majority of companies, but it's not the model in the best companies. In the best companies, they have a very different approach. Uh, In fact, at Netflix, another great product company, Netflix likes to say, we want to lead with context, not control. Mm. And what that means is the the premise at Netflix, and this is the same at Amazon, it's the same at Google, it's the same at Apple. They believe, and this is what Bill Campbell taught, that is not how you get innovative products. You would not have that Alexa device in that model. Mm -hmm. Apple would not have that product we talked about in that model, they believe the, the where innovation comes from is by pushing decisions down to the team. Hmm. Hmm. And the reason to do that is because the teams are working with the enabling technology every single day. In mm-hmm. fact, it was an engineer at Amazon that realized that Alexa was now possible. Mm-hmm. And, and that engineer showed it to the organization said, we could do this. Mm-hmm. And of course they were smart enough to realize that would be a game changer. Mm-hmm. And they sort of built the whole division around it. And um, so pushing decisions down to the team, the engineers know what's possible and those teams are talking to customers every week. So the premise is they're the best position to make these decisions. Mm-hmm. So instead of leading with, control, this is what I want you to build, you instead lead with problems to solve. Mm -hmm. Here's the problem we want to solve for our customers. Mm -hmm. You own it. That's empowered teams. Now, in the language of the book, we talk about feature teams as being, that's what happens in a command and control organization. They're just there to build features. They are literally mercenaries to build those features. And in an empowered team, uh, in, a, in, a, in an empowering organization where they're pushing decisions down, you need empowered product teams that are skilled to solve those problems. You know, in the Netflix example, because I just wrote about this, um, and it, it dovetails exactly into what your message is, Marty. Um, their product teams, I, I mean, if you're using Netflix, you've got features, you know, you can do searching, you know, for, for a film or my most watch or recommend. I mean, these are all features for using, you know, using the platform. Um, the, it was the product teams, the ones that were really down in the, in the weeds, um, they're the ones that came up with this, it's called their open connect distribution system. Because um, mm-hmm. I wrote about how Netflix rarely goes down. You know, when you want to stream something on Netflix, it's pretty rare that you hear there's like a streaming issue. Um, yeah. And the reason why is because it was their product, the very ones that you talked about that made sure that their programs, their, their content based on all the user data of what was most popular was distributed to tens of thousands of servers at internet service providers around the world so that when I wanted to watch an episode of Yellowstone, it wasn't going all the way up to like Netflix's servers. It was being, you know, it was being served to me from my local host because they actually had a copy of that episode of Yellowstone local that they can get to me. Do you know what I mean? Um, I do. And And in fact, Netflix. Go ahead. Well, Netflix is a beautiful example of this principle. They really are. In fact, in my first book, which is called Inspired, that was actually aimed at how you do this product discovery. 
I told the origin story of the first product team in Netflix huh. and how they were almost bankrupt, but they solved a couple very hard problems under stress. <laughs> they solved those problems. And of course, the rest was history. And they've had that culture for a very long time. I mean, I think it's part of their DNA. I agree. Um, it is. And it is, it was a major commitment that they made. You know, you, um, you also write about in objectives about commitments, you talk about a high integrity commitment. Um, yeah. What does that have to do with a team's objectives? Well, look, um, this is the, in the real business world. Every once in a while, we have to, we really do have a date that we have to hit for a very specific thing. It might be there's a major marketing commitment. Like in your business, there may be a partnership that you have. They are going to do their part. You got to do your part. They're asking you, no messing around, Jim. <laughs> Tell right. us, can we count on this? Right. Because we're going to bet big on this on our side. Can we count on this? Right. This right. is what, in order to, to do that well, well, first of all, I should acknowledge in the tech industry, the industry is infamous for missing dates. Right. Infamous. Right. I mean, right. and not missing dates by a little, by the way. <laughs> missing dates often by quarters, by right. long amounts of time. And so when in a real business, though, we have to occasionally make these decisions and uh, these dates, these commitments, and we call that a high integrity commitment. And basically what this really means is that before the team actually says, we can do this by January 1st, and it's going to be this, and you can take it to the bank. Mm. Before they say that, they do enough of the product discovery work I described earlier that they can say with high confidence that they know what they need to do. The biggest problem in tech-powered products is that we don't know what we don't know. <laughs> there are all these lurking issues that have yet to be discovered. And it is very hard to predict what those issues are yeah. in advance. So we do product discovery work, which basically means prototyping in order to know what we don't know. Right. And then when we've uncovered those things, we can with integrity say, all right, we've spent a week in looking into this. We know we can finish this in six weeks. And so we'll give you this date and we'll mean it. Got it. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm jumping around a little bit here, but I, I forgot to ask you, you, you actually wrote a little bit about product strategy and you wrote about Pandora. And I, I, I thought our audience might enjoy hearing this. So you, you wrote about how not to do a product and you use Pandora as an example. And um, I, I, I'd love you to talk a little bit about that story. Yeah, well, and, and I should preface, I, I didn't work with Pandora, but they, they made the mistake of sharing their process very publicly in a uh, public article. And as soon as I read it, I knew what was going to happen. And unfortunately, it did happen to them uh, because they did the opposite of what we call product strategy. In fact, tr literally speaking, they did not have a product strategy. So, But it's worth pointing out because so many companies, they're not as egregious about it as Pandora, but they follow fundamentally that same issue. Mm -hmm. And their situation was, uh, and I feel a lot of sympathy for their situation, but they had a very small technical team. And they wanted to go public with this very small technical team, which honestly, uh, if I had, they had asked me, I would have said they're, they're crazy. But right. they, um, they wanted to do that. Their view was they had to use all their money to pay the artists, right, for royalties. Right. So, and, but they were going to be competing against uh, Spotify, against Apple Music, against Amazon Music. Those are heavy hitters, you know, and so they were just about to get slaughtered. And so their view was, we only have a few engineers. So what we're going to do is we're going to have all the different business leaders. We're going to give them an allocation of like monopoly money. We're going to give this vice president of sales $100. We're going to give this VP of marketing $50. And we're going to say, you tell us the features you want. We'll give you a funny money estimate of that feature. And then you pick whatever you want. Okay. 
Now that's what they did. Um, okay. And in, in their view was, well, then we can, we only have limited resources. We'll do what the business leaders think is most important, which of course is logical, but it's fundamentally um, one of my favorite uh, Steve Jobs used to hold up his iPhone and say, you can conduct a hundred focus groups. You'll never get an iPhone. Okay. Jeff Bezos used to say, um, I can't tell you what to build. Our customers can't tell you what to build. Your job is to invent great solutions on our customers' behalf. <laughs> the point is, this is the command and control model. Right. The people that really know where these innovations are going to come from are not those stakeholders. They're not those executives. So that's why that was the absence of a product strategy. A good product strategy would have looked hard at the customers, looked hard at the technology. And I would argue when you have such a small engineering investment, they needed a good product strategy more than just about anybody else. Right. But they didn't have a product strategy. And so they chased, they built a bunch of features until they were, you know, they lost what three quarters of their market value. And that was unfortunately their story. All right. Listen, we only have a few minutes left. Um, I, I, I don't want to leave you without asking you um, a little bit about some metrics here. Um, you give some advice um, in a later chapter uh, about, you know, having a company dashboard and measuring key results. Uh, you tell a story of Judy Gibbons as well, who's with HP and was with Apple and with Microsoft. Uh, I'm curious if you can you know, share with us some of your thoughts on key results and dashboards and how you're, you know, what metrics you're using to try and track up your product development and a product strategy. Well, sure. Let me try to tie those together too. Yeah. So, um, so good product teams and this is the difference, really, those feature teams will build whatever features the boss says. But if those features don't solve your customer's problem, don't help your business, you can't really blame those engineers for doing that. Mm -hmm. Because it was the bosses that figured that made those choices, like in the case of the Pandora. So what we want to do in a good organization is define outcomes. We want to say, look, if we solve this problem for our customers, how will this improve their lives? How will it improve our business? Those are outcomes. And what we want to hold teams accountable to is achieving those outcomes. However they do it, this feature might work. If it doesn't, try another feature, try a redesign, try making it faster, whatever you have to do. And that's uh, so that's what we mean by outcome-driven. Um, Judy is a longtime board member now of several great companies. Uh, and she understands this. She understands that it's all about achieving outcomes. She, all ex she understands that you won't achieve your business outcomes if you don't please your customers. It's amazing how obvious that is, but it, how many companies don't seem to understand that. They really don't care about their customers' experience. Mm -hmm. Apple really does. Amazon really does. I can tell you that firsthand. They genuinely care about the customer's experience. And they know that if they make a great experience, well, look at what people pay for Apple products. We're like, <laughs> they pay almost sure. anything sure. because sure. it really provides that value. And that's the idea of the outcomes. Uh, and that's what we're looking at. Every company has these measures. Uh, you, at, the, at the minimum, you can go to the board and the board cares about, well, how much did they grow? What's their profitability? Uh, how about how many of their customers repeat every year? These are the kinds of things they care about. Sure. They hope the company is doing the things to continue to improve those, uh, those analytics. And normally the way we do that is provide more and more value to our customers. Everyone, the book is called Empowered, Ordinary People, Extraordinary Products. I've been talking with Marty Kagan. Marty, um, first of all, as you know, obviously we can, throughout this conversation, the book cover has been shown and you know, there's a URL to the book. Um, you can get it on Amazon and in bookstores around the country. Um, your company, Silicon Valley Product Group, it's svpg.com. Uh, is there any other good way to reach you that we'd like to share? Uh, well, um I'm on Twitter and on LinkedIn, uh, and people are free certainly to uh, connect or follow there. Cool. And um, 
Yes. I will do that, actually, and connect to you there. Hey, thank you very much. The book was great. I highly recommend it for anyone that is really looking to develop a great product strategy and to really important, understand the importance of uh, the teams and the people and the, the process that goes behind um, really creating some of the world's greatest products. So, Marty, thanks so much for joining me. It was a great conversation. I wish you best of success with the book. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I hope it was useful. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Stick around.